G'day, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I'm going to start off a tutorial series about materials in Autodesk Revit. Um, so today's uh, deals with the basics and designing materials. So if you already know this one, feel free to skip to the next one where I talk about creating custom materials, which is usually a more popular topic. Um, so these are my sessions I'm planning out. So the basics and assigning is today. Custom materials is the next session and managing a shared material library is the final session. And there'll be, a, there'll be some advanced tutorials following on from there. So how to use advanced materials in 2019 and also how to render in the cloud. Um, so take full advantage of your materials. Um, so today's part one. So what is the purpose of materials? Um, they're, they're there to add realism to your model, uh, whether you're rendering or just going into shaded or realistic mode. Uh, they're there to enhance the drafting appearance of your project, so putting hatch patterns on them, for example, and cut patterns. They're there so they can be keynoted and tagged um, as an asset of elements in a BIM model. And they're also there for the thermal and physical properties when you're doing analysis of a model, such as um, thermal analysis. Um, so we're going to start by just looking at the Autodesk materials that come by default in what's called the AEC materials library. And the maps are usually stored under this common path on your computer, depending how you've been uh, installed. Okay, so we're just going to have a look at the basic library in Revit. So if you go to Manage tab, Materials, that's how you open up your Materials section. I'm just in the default template that comes with Revit, so you should have all these materials available as well. We're just going to start by staying on this material here called Default, um, which is basically like the generic material of Revit. Um, and we're just going to have a look down here. You may not be able to see this tab, so what you might need to do is actually press this button here in order to activate your, your material library, which is docked down the bottom. And basically this is where you store all your material libraries and also your favorite material locations. So in the AEC material library, if you click on this, you've got every material available in the library. However, you've also got categories which filter the library down. So I can just look at two ceramic materials, for example, or just a set of concrete materials. These materials up here are basically your projects materials. Um, so these are actually live in your model. These are not. So let's say we had a wall that we wanted to apply a concrete material to, and we want to pick a particular finish. Uh, we'll just go with a cast in place. Uh, we'll go with a concrete cast in situ. Um, you can see this material already exists in the project, so we'll go with one that doesn't. So we'll go cast in situ lightweight. All you have to do is just click this arrow here, and it will be added to your document. Um, keep in mind that as these change, these don't. You need to actually push these back in like loading a family. Um, so they're not live linked, um, which in some ways is good. Okay, so that's pretty much the AEC library. There's a lot of categories of elements and most of these materials are relatively suitable to work with for a really basic render. Um, but you'll find that the maps might be a little bit lacking or a little bit low quality, um, depending on, I guess, the level of resolution you're looking for in your renders. Um, so we'll just stick with default for now. It's just an example of a material. Um, we're just going to go to the next section of the tutorial, which deals with the aspects of material. So what does the interface mean? Um, so this is the basic interface here that you'd look at in a material. So if I want to replicate that, I'm just in the appearance asset at the moment for that particular material. I'll just reduce the quality to draft, which it is good. Okay. So at the moment we're looking at, I guess, the, the appearance asset of a material. Um, so in terms of the areas, we've just been through the library and how that's set up. Um, so the next section we'll look at is, I guess, these tabs. So these are our identity and our graphics data about our material. And this is what's called the assets of the material. So appearance, now you can also have physical and uh, thermal as well as assets of the material where you can put in data about how it transmits heat um, or its, its physical properties such as ductility and tensility. Um, from there, there's also a whole bunch of information attached to the, the particular appearance asset of this material. So if I open up this material here, you see I've got a lot of things such as the information of it. So the name, keywords, when you search for it. Um, on the generic, so this is, this is a, I guess, what we'd call a generic material asset. Um, it has a majority of the elements you'd need to create a basic material. So you have generic, so you have a color, which you can also use an image for instead of a color. And you can balance that, that image as well. Um, there's, there's also highlights. You can basically have a glossier material if it's metallic. Um, it's a bit hard to see here because we don't have an image assigned to it, but it will slightly increase, I guess, the glossiness of the material in a, in a lit environment. Let's go to grid light. Um, you can add reflectivity to the material as well. So if you turn that on, you can, you can change the strength of the direct reflections versus the, the less direct reflections. So just how glossy is it? 
Um, maybe it has no direct reflection, it's just reflecting light at, a, at an odd angle, or it might be fully reflective, so a, a chrome, essentially. And as you tick these on, you'll see that these become a part of the material's properties. It can be transparent, so how translucent is your material? Is it see-through? And what's its refraction rating? They're, they're quite important. And likewise, you can connect images to these as well, or maps as we call them, or you can pick particular types of uh, textures to use instead. So you can see in this case, for example, where it's black, it's not reflecting, and where it's white, it is. Um, so feel free to play with that one as well. Um, there's cutouts. Cutouts basically are quite straightforward. Where you have black, uh, they will cut the material, and where you have white, they won't. Um, I can't probably find a very good example of a cutout here in the Autodesk library, but there you go. You can see where there's a, I guess, black in this, this Hessian material. You can see it's actually becoming, in this case, slightly translucent because it's not fully black, but it can be used to cut out. So we'll run through that in a little bit. Um, the material can illuminate as well. So you can say that it's a, maybe a, a halogen lamp lens, and this will actually become a light source as well. Um, which can be great for um, sealing diffusers. Uh, bump maps will give texture or depth to your material when light is cast upon it. So you can see there it's getting a bit of a grain on it now. And if I change the scale of this a little bit, you'll see that more intensely. You can start to see that, that weathering appearing on the material um, if I assign the map to that. And also the tint is where you can just apply an override color, which will work over the top of any image that you apply to the image, to the material itself. Um, the graphics tab is a little bit more basic. So the shading tab is basically what color your material will be when you're in shaded mode. You can tell it to be driven by the material. And if it's using an image or a, a color, it will find the average color of that overall image and connect it to this and update. But typically I release this uh, in order to get the, the right color that I want it to be for my shaded mode. And then um, you can set transparency of your material here as well in shaded mode. So glass typically will be 75 to 95% or somewhere thereabouts. Um, surface patterns are basically, if you want like a brick texture or something like that. So let's say we had a brick wall, you'd want to apply like a brick texture to it. And texture alignment allows you to line up your material map with your, your brick texture, essentially in this case. Um, it's important to make sure that your size uh, matches. So if we had a an image map for a masonry wall here, which might be a little bit hard to find because the material map library is very large, at least the Autodesk one is. Um, keep in mind that a lot of the materials aren't very good. So even though it looks very, very expensive, it's not, not really that expensive. Let's say we had a tile wall and we want that to be uh, 300 by 300 tiles. So because I have two by two, I have to make it 600 by 600. And then from there, we, what we want to do is actually have a model pattern that correlates in size to that. So we'd have to have some 300 millimeter squares. So let's just make a really basic pattern. A 300 millimeter cross hatch. There we go. And if I go to texture alignment, you actually see the image and the texture and how they align. Um, typically, if they're the same size, Rivet will figure out roughly how to align them for you, but it's good to make sure that it's working there. Um, you can do double, uh, so foreground and background pattern, um, like you can with filled regions in 2019 and beyond. Um, likewise, you can do cut patterns as well. And it's important to note that cut patterns cannot, cannot be model patterns. They can only be drafting patterns. So if I had a uh, like a brickwork wall here, for example, I could use the brickwork pattern, but I couldn't use a say a circular model pattern for a precast wall, like some people sometimes want to. Um, one thing that's really important to note that's happening here is when I change this asset, you'll note that I'm using the generic appearance asset at the moment. So basically up here, if you go to this replace asset button, this takes you to the asset browser, um, where you can search for particular types of material assets for appearance and also physical and thermal in some cases. Um, so I could, I could take this default material and say, actually, I want to make it a, an ash door if I want to. Um, but the problem is that you'll see as I do that, other materials that might be using that same asset have followed suit. So my default floor and my default light source have sort of followed it down the rabbit hole, unfortunately, because they're all connected to the same asset. So you can use multiple assets across multiple materials, which is a really common issue people run into when they don't manage these well. A better workflow, if you want to create a material asset that is new or different to another one in the model is to duplicate it and rename it 
So if you expand the information tab, you can rename it to something different. And then if you do something special to that material, such as make it blue and make the image 50% faded, you'll notice that it doesn't affect the other materials because they're no longer using the same asset. So that's really important to understand. Um, so that's sort of a really quick crash course in, I guess, the, the Autodesk library and how you can work with it. Um, but there's obviously a lot of play that you'll want to do with that in order to fully understand just what, what's available and what quality it is as well. Um, but just keep in mind the maps aren't typically a high level of resolution. So for example, if I load in this brick texture and I go to this particular image map, you'll notice that it's not going to be the most, uh, the most pretty element. Actually, this one's a bit of a tricky asset to get them at the image for. I may just get one from here. So if I open this particular, this particular map, you'll see that it's not really that, that great. It's better than it was in older versions. Um, but it's not that great of a resolution when you zoom in, it's quite pixelated. Um, and there's not a lot of opportunity to repeat the pattern without uh, being really obvious that you're repeating a pattern just a few bricks down the line if you tiled this. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so next step we'll just move to um, is to look at material assets and how we can manage their properties. So we've looked at each of these three assets and how you can modify their properties. Um, but we'll look at some different templates because the one that I showed you before is what you'd call a generic material asset. Um, some materials are set up in different ways in how their asset behaves depending on what type of material they are. Um, for example, if I go to a wood material, you'll note that it's using a wood asset. It's got things that are customized to what would suit a timber material. Um, so it's important to start with the right type of asset as your starting point. So if I was making another wood, I'd probably duplicate another wood material so that I could use a similar thing because wood has special things such as being able to stain the map a particular color. So if I restain this, uh, obviously blue is not very logical, but you can, you can basically stain the image without losing the texture and then still tint it as well if you so choose. So there's a lot more control and they have things like semi-gloss varnish, satin varnish. They have different levels of, I guess, what you'd, what you'd have for timber. So they predefine your reflection um, and you can define what application you use it for. I haven't found a use for that before. Um, whereas other materials will follow different sorts of assets. So if I go to a concrete material, typically these ones instead will typically just be based on a color. Um, is it sealed? And then beyond that, uh, what is the weathering treatment of this material? So you can do automatic or you can link it up to a custom bump map instead, um, which makes them easier to work with sometimes. Some people I know prefer to just work with the default asset and use that because the default asset has full customizability. Um, but I know others prefer to work with those lightweight assets. Uh, I always recommend that at the very least with glass, you work with the glass asset because the glass asset is pretty functional and it has a lot of good predefined colors, reflectiveness, sheets of glass. It, it does quite a lot of good things already. Um, but otherwise, most other materials can probably be derived from the default asset. It's good to also probably look into metals as well because metals have a lot of great defaults as well in terms of types of metal and level of polish or finish. Um, so I'd say metal is probably another good example. Um, but when in doubt, the default asset is probably a good place to start. So it's good to be mindful of that. Um, it's important when you set up material maps or use material maps uh, to keep an eye out for seams and make sure that they're seamless. Uh, otherwise, you'll get some very odd appearances on your render. So you can see here, for example, the seaming of this texture is very obvious because it hasn't been built in order to meet the next tile along, because essentially the left side and the right side and the top and the bottom meet each other when they tile. So you need that to be a condition that actually blends. Um, so you can see here, I've got two tiles here of a grass texture that's seamless and you can't see it, but there's actually a seam line down the middle here. And this side of the texture lines up to this side of the texture when they meet. So it's important to try and either find seamless textures or build seamless textures in Photoshop. Um, so we're going to look at appearance maps now. So you, you recall before that I pointed out that you can link up various images to certain aspects of materials instead of colors. Uh, that's probably a bad example. I'll just go back to my default material. So you can typically link up images to a lot of places. So not only can you add an image to the material, but you can link up images to bump maps and you can also override these settings with, with maps. 
themselves that guide the material uh, in a more specific nature than a generic setting would. So there's a lot of types of maps to be aware of, um, but we'll just run through some of the basics. Uh, diffuse is obviously the most basic one. It's really the image map that you'd apply to an appearance of a material. Um, but we're gonna run through some other ones. So bump maps are very common. Uh, most materials will have a bump map of some sort or a roughness map, some materials call it, um, which tells light how to interact with the bumps in the surface. Um, but it doesn't actually indent the material in 3D. Uh, even when you render it, it's really just informing the light how to behave on the surface. And they typically look a little bit like this. So they're typically black and white, and they're usually in higher contrast. And where they're black, they'll usually be more indented and, and pick up less light. And where they're protruded, they'll be white and they'll pick up more light. Um, making a bump map is quite easy. So we've got a brick material here. If you wanted to make a bump map out of this, you could really just uh, typically desaturate and get your levels command. And you can either eye drop and source the white points or the black points, or you can just play with the sliders to enhance the contrast of, the, of this, this particular view until you have, a, I guess, a medium that, that you work with. Um, you can use these eye droppers to actually play with the points of the, the file a bit more. Uh, I recommend that you just play with this yourself and find a good workflow or a good balance that works for you. But that would probably be quite an effective bump map because you've got quite a high level of contrast now and it will really accentuate the, the depth of those mortar joints in the brick. Um, so if we look at some other types of maps, we've got displacement and normal maps. These are only relevant for advanced materials in Revit 2019, but they're very common in other programs such as 3ds Max and most computer software. So displacement maps or normal maps actually tell a material how to physically offset itself in 3D. So you can see here on the left, this is a displacement map. And this is a bump map next to it. And you'll see the bump map when it's actually on the surface of the sphere has no depth. However, the displacement map is actually lifting that material, which uh, creates a much more realistic depth effect on a surface um, or an indentation. Uh, and they typically look like this. So they're typically this color, um, even in Revit, which informs the material where it should lift uh, from its surface. Um, so they're good to be aware of, but only in 2019 and beyond. Um, so reflection and refraction can be connected to maps, um, which tells light how to interact with the surface. So typically white is a more intense reaction and black is a less intense reaction. So for example, a water material, you would usually use a reflection material that looks something like this, maybe a bit more extreme to get this sort of effect when you pick it up um, in the light so that only certain patches of the water surface will pick up the light, which creates the effect of, I guess, a rippled surface. Um, cutout maps are quite helpful. So essentially where a cutout map is black, it will cut away the material physically. Um, so you can use this for things like chain link fences and perforated materials. And in realistic mode in Revit, this will show the cutout as well, but not in shaded mode. So just be aware of that. Typically with cutout materials, I'll give them a transparency uh, in shaded mode so that you can still see through them to some degree to enhance that effect when you're in shaded mode as well. Um, so I thought I'd show you just a few examples of how you can apply materials as well, just because a lot of people ask me that quite a lot. So the first case study we'll look at is just system families like walls and ceilings and then curtain panels and mullions uh, for a facade system, how to paint things, and then just how to work in the family environment with materials. So if I just go back in the model and just make a wall. So as you probably know, under type properties in a wall, you can go to the structural layer. And this is in walls where you can change materials. So essentially I could take that and make it my default material instead. And if I go into 3D and go around there, you'll see that surface pattern I set up. And if I go to realistic mode, you'll also see that, that texture I align to it. And I'll see if I render, I'll also get that effect. So I'm just going into ray trace mode here from my, from my ribbon. And there you are, you can see my material has been applied. Um, likewise, ceilings and roofs are pretty much the same. Any element with a layering system applied to it essentially works the same way. So in the structure of a roof, same thing. I could hook up my, my material. And if you know the name of your material, you can type it. Otherwise, you can just click on these three dots here, which will navigate you to the material browser where you can pick another material. So it's good to be mindful of those particular systems. Um, curtain panels and mullions are almost the same. So if you're working with system panels, that's quite easy. You just find them in the browser and you just change their type properties and you'll find a, a property called material down here. So this is where you can change it to say glass. 
and that would actually make your solid panel glazed, for example. Um, curtain wall mullions are the same, so you just go to their type properties, and they'll also have a property called material, where you can go and assign a different material to them. And then your curtain system will use the materials of those elements when it, when it uses them as the host. Um, so I think the other example was the paint material. So I, I try not to use this tool very often because it's a bit of a misleading tool. Uh, but let's say this was a plasterboard wall when you wanted to paint its surface with a particular material. So if you just go up to this tool here, paint, you can actually pick a material from the model and paint that surface um, a different color, for example. So you could paint the wall essentially. But just be mindful that like it, it hasn't changed the structural layer of that wall, it's only the very outside surface that's been painted, which is why it's not a great tool typically, because most things have thickness, um, even paints and renders sometimes have a thickness when you model them. So just be mindful of that workflow. So don't, don't use it for painting tiles onto a wall, for example, um, model the tiles instead. And the last thing is in a family environment, um, how you can apply materials. So if I'll just make a new family, and we'll just make a generic model or just any any old family, I guess. Um, I'm not going to save it, so not too important. Furniture. So it's almost the same, except I guess in families, as you know, typically you model geometry instead of system families. And if you highlight that geometry, you get a material parameter that you can connect materials up to. Keep in mind that you won't have the same materials you have in your library um, in the project. So in a later session, we'll look at how to set up a shared material library to be able to migrate materials between the family and the project environment. It's really important to note as well that if I change a material in the family itself, um, I'll just leave this with the same name and I'll just make it something really weird. I'll, I'll make it pink in color and I'll just make its asset glass and we'll just say that it's bronze and 100% reflective uh, four sheets of glass. So at the project, before I load this in, I'm just gonna double check I have a material called glass with an asset called glass. It's called clear, so let's just rename this to glass temporarily. So what will happen if we load this in our project is that it won't actually update that material in the project level instead the family will adopt the same material so you'll see that this is still the same it hasn't ended up changing its properties so glass is still blue it's not pink and um, you'll see that if i check that material as well it's not adopting that strange setting that we applied at the family level so just be mindful that the project ultimately is king in this scenario it will hold the settings of the materials um, unless a, a new material comes in through a family good to be mindful of that so in the next session, we're gonna look at actually setting up some custom materials from scratch. So how we're gonna look at making um, like a nicer brick wall as an example. So we'll apply some custom maps and uh, we'll go to the point of rendering it. And we'll also look more into the properties of materials as well. So how you can tag them and code them. And from there, we'll look at a shared material library um, so that you can, you can actually bring the whole thing together on a server environment, for example, and then some advanced techniques later. Um, so thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed um, this introduction to materials. Um, there's obviously a lot more to come, a uh, very basic session, but you've got to start with the basics to go on to the trickier things. Uh, so I'll see you on the next one. Um, if you have any comments or queries, feel free to leave them down below. And if you enjoyed what you see, um, feel free to follow and subscribe. Thanks. Take care. Bye.